This is A Sustainable Mind, episode 16. Once we are living on our feet and once we have agency and dignity about the way that we're living our lives and we are very confident that we are seeing the interconnectedness between things, that's when we can move together as a whole and actually cause the systems change that it's going to take to make sure that our species has a healthy place to live. Welcome to A Sustainable Mind Podcast, where we delve into the minds behind today's most impactful environmental campaigns, organizations, and startups, inspiring the environmental change makers of tomorrow. I'm your host, Marjorie Alexander. Hey friend, are you an avid listener of A Sustainable Mind? Or maybe this is your first time listening. I want to know a little bit more about the environmental and sustainability topics that you want to learn more about because I want to gear future episodes to your interests. Send the word survey to the number 323-536-1120, or just visit our homepage, asustainablemind.com. Now, on to the interview. Nikki Silvestri has had a long history of working to support environmental justice and growing sustainable communities. As the co-founder of Live Real and former executive director of People's Grocery and Green for All, Nikki has built and strengthened social equity for underrepresented populations in food systems, social services, public health, climate solutions, and economic development. Now, as the co-founder and CEO of Silvestri Strategies, she is working to support thriving communities, economies, and natural environments. So how are you doing? And tell me about what you've been up to, because you have been a very, very busy woman. Yes. (laughs) It's been a pretty busy year. I am I'm doing a series of projects that link climate change to food systems. Oh wow. Which is a deep passion of mine. There is some there's some climate change stuff that doesn't cross over to food systems land and vice versa. But I really after running two different organizations that focused on, you know, one focused on food systems and one focused on climate, mm-hmm. I was really excited about the merge of the two. And nice. so that's been the bulk of my work this year. Why don't you go ahead and tell us a little bit about how the environment and nature played a part in your life growing up? I grew up in Los Angeles, California, and my one of the earliest memories I have is going into the backyard with my grandmother mm-hmm. and picking berries from her bush. And we would then go in the house in the summertime and stir them up with some sugar, and I would hear her talk about her father and her mother and their life in the South. And I really got the sense that it never occurred to me as environmentalism. It just occurred to me as common sense, right? Like my grandmother was the type of person who would ask you how you slept and how were your bowels, just as a rule, every time she saw you. And the more that I learn about gut health and sleep, the more I'm like, wow, Nana actually knew what she was talking about. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So I feel like my my entrance to environmentalism was my entrance to holism, that we are animals in a habitat. There's a way for us to be in harmony with what's happening in our bodies and what's happening in our external environment. That sounds like that is a large part of your worldview. Can you talk a little bit more about how, as individuals, we play a part in this larger system? not just the earth ecosystem, but how that uh, makes a difference with climate change. Because I think a lot of people feel like, well, these small actions that I could take, it's not going to make a difference. I'm only one person, you know, whether I choose to recycle this bottle or bring a reusable cup to Starbucks when I get my coffee, that's not going to make a big difference because it's just me. But it sounds like your worldview growing up all the way through adulthood has been one that everything impacts everything else. Talk yeah. a little bit more about your, your worldview and, and how that plays into your work. What we can impact as individuals is ourselves and our family, and depending on how big we want to go, our society. And for me, that's enough. I think that this holism view for an African-American woman that was growing up in Southern California in the late 80s, early 90s, it was a trying time. Mm-hmm. And having a holistic worldview meant that I was psychologically, emotionally, and spiritually healthier than I would have been had that worldview not been in place. And so much of the world, I mean, when we live in a world where the top 80 people 
in terms of wealth have just as much wealth as the bottom 3.56 billion. Mm -hmm. Personal health is not something to sniff at. It can be the difference between saving your life or making it so that you live on your feet instead of living on your knees. And when it comes to a systems view, once we are living on our feet and once we have agency and dignity about the way that we're living our lives and we are very confident that we are seeing the interconnectedness between things and that we understand our role in the way that we make the world, that's when we can move together as a whole and actually cause the systems change that it's going to take to make sure that our species has a healthy place to live. Mm-hmm. in the next 100 to 200 years. So that's kind of, that's where it goes into my work is that there's an inside outside strategy. I talk a lot about social infrastructure with the projects that I do. And that's one of the things that people usually want me to come in and do is that there will be a wonderful initiative involving the climate or involving food, et cetera. But the bonds between the people that are working on that initiative aren't necessarily strong enough to make sure that it's successful. There are cultural differences. There are class differences. There are so many differences. And it's a broad coalition of people, usually, that makes things happen. And the way to build a broad coalition is by having this inside-outside strategy that ensures that we're being whole humans Mm -hmm. while we're creating whole initiatives. Awesome. Let's talk about your work with Green for All. And if I'm not mistaken, that was kind of a launching point for you. I mean, I first found out about you in the uh, the Roots article, the 100 Most Influential African Americans uh, for 2014, I believe. Mm-hmm. And then was reading about your work with People's Grocery in Oakland. So talk about how you got involved with those organizations, what part you played and how that's impacted your work moving into Live Real, which is your new initiative or organization that you've co-founded. Well, in terms of chronology, Live Real actually came before either one of those. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That Live Real, when was that? That was 2008. Mm -hmm. That when I was, when I was really in green jobs, I was actually at Green for All in 2008 when it was first starting. Mm -hmm. And I was a I was a researcher and special assistant to the president there. And it was, it was an incredible time because I was learning a lot about green jobs. I'd been in education before that and working a lot with the foster system. So working on green jobs was fairly new to me, but it felt like it was something really important. And so it was during that time that I co-founded Live Real with a series of other food activists in the country. And um, Anim Steele is one that's top of mind for me. He's the executive director of the Real Food Challenge, which is another wonderful organization. And we were really thinking about young people in America, young people as in people under 35, Mm -hmm. and the way that we're going to be the power holders very soon. So what are we going to do with that? And how are we going to make sure that the most diverse and the most put upon in some ways when it comes to health conditions and debt generation? is going to make sure that we're healthy and is going to make sure that our children are healthy. And then people's grocery was a natural extension of that. Mm-hmm. I saw Michelle Obama plant the White House garden in 2009 and thought that we have a we have a pretty specific window of time when food is going to be catapulted into the middle of the mainstream conversation as a key topic. Mm-hmm. And so my tenure at People's Grocery was really positioning that organization to be to lead in the national discussion about food insecurity and what that means for people of color and low-income people in inner cities. What does that mean for people who are living in cities and underprivileged communities, minorities? Uh, Why the focus on food and why does food play such a large part in lifestyle security? I suppose You, you could broaden it a little bit and just talk about life security, but why is food so pivotal in that? Food... This is one of those questions where sometimes I feel like I miss the forest for the trees because food <laughs> is everything for me. Mm-hmm. You know, like if I'm if I'm not talking to myself. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can talk to yourself and then you can talk to us. I, I do. I do want to look at this, you know, from a lot of different angles. So please go ahead. Well, one angle is that. If an individual is not practiced at 
thinking about the environment. Mm -hmm. The gateway to thinking about the environment is thinking about food. And if one is not practiced in thinking about how to change the world, then they can think about changing their dietary habits so that they feel better. Mm -hmm. I just feel like food and diet specifically is an entry point to be able to talk to anyone about anything. Because if I want to talk about the environment, then I start talking about how food gets to your plate, Mm -hmm. where it comes from, the way that when it comes to carbon emissions, cows and the way that we do confined animal feedlots is a huge contributor to climate change and or the way that our soil is degrading because of the way that we're growing monocrops. Mm -hmm. And if I want to talk to people about health and what change looks like from the inside to the outside, the radical changes that can happen in someone's body when they change their diet over the course of just a week, just consuming more water. So it feels like it's the prism that is food is the colors go in in every direction. And the last thing that I'll say about it is that when I talk about building social infrastructure and making sure that the bonds between people are strong so that we can do good work together, I think there was a, there was a study done that I will try to find for you that talked about how people have the best ideas. Mm-hmm. And it was, it was millions of dollars were spent on this study. And at the end, what they found was that you get people together over a table of food. And let them talk. <laughs> that is how you get the best ideas. So there's a way that the table and consuming food together in community builds the strongest kind of bonds between people that there are. And it has been a meeting place for a society since we've been human. In your work with food, especially as you say it being, it's, it's one of the gateways and a pretty darn good one for talking about climate change. What has been surprising to you as in terms of the transformations that you've seen in people, how, how food brings people together, but how have you been surprised? Like, what have you seen that it's like, I just didn't think that that would happen. Yes, you get people together over food or work that you're doing through the people's grocery. But what are the surprises that you've seen come out of the community because people are getting together over food and where their food comes from? So I'll actually, I'll use one example from my time as the executive director of Green For All last year, because the the piece that I forgot to link is that I was at Green For All when it first started, and then mm-hmm. I returned last year as the executive director. So yeah, I was really, noting that in your, in your, because I've been following you for a couple of years, and I'm like, I'm seeing some, some different yeah. stuff popping up in your about page. So, okay, go ahead. Yeah, it was a, it was a really beautiful full circle moment, but we were working with the Environmental Protection Agency to encourage African-Americans all over the country to support the Clean Power Plan. And the way that we worked at Green for All, one of the things I love about that organization is that from the very beginning, it invested deeply in social infrastructure and in people, knowing that those who are most vulnerable to climate change, we need relationship. We need camaraderie. We need heart and inspiration. So we did a tour. We did a national tour. And you can't really do a good tour unless there's good food. And there was a moment where we went to the Juneteenth Festival in Denver, Colorado. Mm -hmm. And the majority of the festival was just food and music. It Mm -hmm. was just booth after booth after booth after booth of barbecue Mm -hmm. and homemade lemonade. And then more barbecue. For pe- I'm sorry, for people who don't, who don't know, explain to them what Juneteenth is, because I'm sure a lot of people aren't aware. Thank you for that. <laughs> Juneteenth is the celebration of when the last slave realized that they were free, that there were several states in the South that didn't inform their slaves that emancipation had happened for sometimes years. So Juneteenth, June 19th, is the day that the last slave found out that they were free quote unquote, but that's just when, you know, everyone knew for free. Yeah, right, right. Okay, go ahead. (laughs) Being in, just being in celebration with my folks and chomping down some barbecue while from the stage talking about how so many more African-Americans have asthma than Mm -hmm. the mainstream folks in this country and something, you know, close to 70% of African Americans live within 30 miles of a coal power plant. Statistics like that, 
mean that we need to support something like the clean power plan and clean that up. And being able to discuss that over good food is, it just made it that much more impactful. And I feel like when I have, when I've worked with people that are in survival mode, when we can hold hands and I can share stories about eating at McDonald's growing up and how when I was having a bad day, when I was eating lunch every day by myself in the fifth grade because I was that weirdo, that good food made it better. And that good food makes things like that better. Absolutely. Do you find that, well, I'll give a little bit of background on myself. My family, my mom's side of the family owns land in Texas, and they are very much about legacy of keeping the land in the family and family heirlooms and but also you know just in current culture you know the last 20 30 years there's a lot of purchasing of things and a lot of accumulation of things and obviously i understand you know the time that my grandparents grew up in and the time that their parents grew up in and it's kind of important to hold on to what you have and to pass it along to the next generation. But in all of this, do you find that you have to speak about climate change a little bit differently to those in the African diaspora because of our history? Restate that one more time. Like you just mentioned, you know, one entry point into climate change is food. Another entry point into climate change is disadvantaged communities being so close to areas of industry. That's another entry point. But as far as other things go, so if you're a relatively affluent African-American person, so you're not necessarily dealing with those issues of being in a polluted area. So your kid has asthma, you know, I I just feel like it's in my family, it's difficult to talk about climate change because they're very concerned about holding on to me and my stuff and the accumulation of stuff is another part of climate change because of just the production of things the waste stream you know not fixing and reusing what we already have things like that i know we're kind of going off on another tangent but i feel like you have a oh, have a good uh, handle on this topic yes 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 okay got it A couple of things. When it comes to more affluent African Americans not necessarily being a part of that Mm -hmm. statistic, one of the most affluent African American communities in the country is the Ladera Heights Baldwin Hills community down in Los Angeles. And it's across the street from the largest urban oil field in the country. You're right. I pass I pass there every day going to work. So I yeah. (laughs) Yep, literally. And that's where I grew up. The elementary school that is across the street from that oil field, Windsor Hills Elementary. That's where I went to school. My parents still live in that neighborhood. So, and there was fracking there a couple of years ago. So it, it is, it's very, very relevant. I have asthma, et cetera, all of that. So when it comes to holding on to the things that we have, there's a way to look at that that is actually this holistic view, mm-hmm. Right. My grandmother held on to things because she repurposed Mm -hmm. them. There was a sense that there isn't enough to waste things. You use it until it's Mm -hmm. done. You fry that chicken, (laughs) you save that oil. Right. right? And so the consumer, the it's the it's the way that we have disposable products that became problematic because having disposable non-biodegradable products when people are in the mindset that you use what you have and you reuse it until it's done is mismatch. And so one thing for me is when I talk to older black folks, especially we have a, we have a pretty deep conversation about quality that food as you know, to go back to that as an example, when you're dealing with an entire, an entire cow or an entire hog, Yes, you do make chitlins and hoghead cheese because you're using the entire animal and you're getting every calorie that you can out of that animal. And if it's a healthy animal that you have raised and you've loved and you've tended to, that's a really good thing. But if you are using everything on a pig that's been completely mistreated, 
that's probably terrible for you. And the quality of just the the metals and the aluminum and the the raw materials that we used to use, you could actually make those into mm-hmm. other things. But the way that we have done industry over the last few decades has made that lifestyle a bit difficult. And I find that when I have that conversation with people, it absolutely makes sense. The question then becomes, well, then what do we do with that? In terms of your lifestyle, how do you embody being an earth conscious being? Yes. I embody being an earth conscious being by really tending to this inside outside strategy in my reflective and contemplative practice so much of what i sit with is the fact that all beings are interconnected and if that's true that means that i notice more right so it would then impact every action that i do because i'm much more aware that if i kill that spider that is building, you know, something approximating a dream catcher out of sticks <laughs> on my front yard. And then I have an insect problem. Yeah. Maybe there's a connection between those two things because spiders are predators that take care of the little critters that I may not want in my house. And if I mm. if I take a little if I go a little bit out of my way to go shopping at a store that is local and sources local products, and that uses materials that are easily biodegradable or recycled, then maybe I'm contributing a bit, not only to the local economy, but also to ensuring that I'm not filling up landfills and et cetera. And I think it also importantly, Mm -hmm. living an earth conscious lifestyle doesn't mean that I do everything right. It also means that I'm much more aware that this computer that I'm using to do this interview with you is using materials that I mean, the way these material, the way our technology is sourced and the way that it is disposed of is terrible, frankly. But I wouldn't give up being connected to the world because of that. We have to find a healthy compromise. And in a lot of ways, it's that healthy compromise that I think glitches people a bit because it's easy to have rhetoric that you can be carbon neutral or completely sustainable in one's lifestyle, but we can't. Not if we want some of the conveniences that we have afforded ourselves. And I seriously doubt that anyone in the mainstream would be willing to give up the internet or be willing to (laughs) give up cell phones. So we actually have to find a way to have a healthy compromise. The most green of us have to figure out how to have a healthy compromise and how to talk about that. I want to talk now about more about your organizations. So you are back being the executive director of Green for All? No, no. Now I am the CEO of a consultancy called Sylvester Strategies. That's what I've been doing in 2015. Okay. And is Live Real part of that or how how does it all work? (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, founded Live, co-founded Live Real first. That is its own entity that I'm still an advisor for. Mm -hmm. And then I was the executive director of People's Grocery, still love them, communicate with them was the executive director of Green for All, still love them, communicate with them. The new director there, Vien Trung, is brilliant, (laughs) brilliant. And now I am doing my own firm that is moving at the intersection of climate change and food systems with a healthy dose of the social infrastructure that I've been speaking of. Excellent. Awesome. So in all of this work, what or who would you consider to be those main pieces, those pivotal volunteers, uh, staff members, partnerships with other organizations that looking back on the last 10 years of work, what have been those components that you feel has really contributed to the success of one or all of these organizations? The first thing that's coming up for me is it's the residents of West Oakland. Hmm. People's Grocery was, it is located in West Oakland and focuses on the West Oakland community. West Oakland is 30,000 people with 52 liquor stores and no full service grocery store. And West Oakland is 
a community that has a ton of ridiculously incredible history. It's where, it's where the first Black Panther Free Breakfast program was housed at a church in West Oakland. The UNIA, the United Negro Improvement Association, still has an office in West Oakland. One of the first Black cooperatives, the West Oakland Food Cooperative in the early 80s, was founded in West Oakland. There's just, West Oakland as a place, as a place of history for African Americans specifically, Mm -hmm. is very rich. And people in West Oakland still have that kind of drive. They just working in a different context. And so I feel like one of the successes of People's Grocery was being able to actually hold the residents as being all they needed to be to create what they wanted to see. And we were just the way station to route resources and context and make sure that they had what they needed to create what they wanted. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to Green for All, I feel like it was actually pretty similar. Only instead of it just being the residents of West Oakland, it was it was asking the right questions and having a holistic view of people of color and low-income people. We did a survey, a national survey, to look at how African Americans, Latinos, and Asians felt about climate change. And, mm-hmm. you know, 75% of the respondents nationally felt like climate change is one of the top issues that we're facing right now. And the results of this survey flew in the face of everyone who says that you can't talk to people of color about climate change. Mm-hmm. No, actually, we care more about climate change than the mainstream, as it turns out. And I feel like things like that happen all the time for me, that it, I don't have to fight the mainstream story about African Americans and people of color because of the work that I do, because I have so much data to the contrary. Mm-hmm. But it feels really important to me that I am vocal and clear about that data so that we can start to change the story about who we are. So speaking of changing the story, moving to Silvestri strategies, what's coming up for you guys? What's, uh, what's on the horizon? What are you moving towards? What are you excited about? There are a few, few projects that are really exciting to me. A main one is working on carbon sequestration through soil, which feels like it's I'm I'm slightly obsessed with it right now because it feels like it's the it's the linkage between everything that I've done. It is a huge it is a huge thing. So please be, thing. be obsessed. So for those who don't know what that is, we emit about 32 billion tons of CO2 through fossil fuel usage globally a year. And there was a study done that showed that if you are just looking at the top 18 inches of soil, we could sequester between 10 and 30% of that Mm. per year. And considering that I believe 2014 was the first year that our carbon emissions stayed steady and didn't Mm. increase. So we are set to actually turn back the clock when it comes to our carbon emissions. There, the missing story for me is that we talk about reducing emissions But we don't really talk about carbon sequestration, not yet, because we've been so obsessed with stopping, just stopping the the damage. Let's stop breaking the machine. (laughs) We can talk (laughs) about fixing it. And there are island communities and indigenous communities that are currently underwater. Yes. As collateral damage, Mm -hmm. because we are so focused on just stopping emissions and not sequestering carbon right now. We don't have to have that inevitable two degrees centigrade or 10 feet of ocean level rise if we can look at storing the carbon that's in the atmosphere back where it should be, which is in the soil. Mm -hmm. And the fact that we've lost something like 70 to 90 percent of the nutrient density of our food because we've lost carbon in the soil and carbon is key to microorganisms and ensuring that plants actually get the nutrients from the soil that they need to be nutrient dense for us to eat. Mm-hmm. I could go off. I could go off. <laughs> so that is carbon sequestration through soil. And what I'm working on specifically is working with the cap and trade money in the state of California, some of which is going to be funneled into a healthy soils initiative to ensure that that money goes into economic development and can benefit those that are most vulnerable to climate change. So we've produced a convening this year. We're going to be doing a white paper next year and working with a series of advocates across the state 
And we're also looking into business development and support with mm. climate beneficial businesses. So there's going to be some stuff around shepherding, and then there's going to be some stuff around fashion and climate beneficial clothing. And if for the listeners to either help or get involved, how would they do that? I know that you're you're ramping up with all of this, but is there any way that an individual can can help with these projects right now? And right. if so, where can they go to to get in touch with you? Yeah, so really the best way is to connect with me via Twitter. Mm-hmm. And just because I find that that's it. we are newsletters are effective, but direct <laughs> tweets are even more effective. Ah, okay. So send me at, at Nikki C. Silvestri a direct tweet or just mention me and let me know what you're interested in. Because in addition to that, the soil sequest or the carbon sequestration through soil is just one project. I'm also teaching a course on ethical leadership in food business with the Food Business School. We're also doing a series of cultural healing and racial healing initiatives with a community center for young black and brown men in the city of Oakland. There are a number of things that we're working on. And so knowing that the key pieces of the work are social equity, building social infrastructure, the bonds between people, climate change and food systems of those four areas, let me know what you're most interested in. And I will let you know what we're working on. Very cool. And now that you've said all of that, I have a couple people that I'm definitely going to give them your information because I think that you guys could do some awesome work together. So cool. What is one unexpected gift or benefit on a personal level? I know that we've talked a little bit about this uh, throughout the conversation thus far, but one thing that you just kind of didn't expect that you were going to receive as a result of cultivating all of these organizations and in the work that you're doing right now? A healthy respect for what it takes to lead. Green for All was founded by Van Jones and was later taken on by Phaedra Ellis Lampkins. And the board of directors at that organization when I was there were incredibly powerful Black folks. And I feel like having a Having a healthy respect for what it takes both personally and in the world to actually lead and to make hard decisions, even looking at the way that we we treat Obama, you know, we can have a bunch of opinions, but would any of us want to actually run the United States? (laughs) (laughs) That's what I feel like I've gained. Excellent, excellent. Is there anything that was holding you back from, I don't want to say uh, going off on your own, because obviously you've, you've cultivated all of these relationships and you're taking these people with you, but in terms of doing your own thing, was there anything that was holding you back from that? It was mostly wor- being worried about whether I could be a full-time mother and full-time wife and a full-time professional at the same time, especially considering my lifestyle that I... I travel nationally. I've got stuff going on in DC and New York and just all over the place. And what soothed that for me is that for women especially, we actually have to design something new when it comes to the way that we lead. And that was that was actually very key for me starting my own company because I wanted to actually design the lifestyle that would allow me to be full in every one of these aspects and also allowed me to move at a pace really significantly that allowed me to be full in all of these aspects. It's really easy to run as fast as people want you to run because of urgency. Mm -hmm. And I just don't do that. (laughs) I can respect that. What is one longstanding habit that has helped you get there? I don't drink alcohol, which sounds funny now that I say it out loud, but I, I've been pretty substance free my whole life. I drank for six months when I turned 21 and was done with it. (laughs) You got it all out of your system. Yeah, I'm done. And a part of that for me is that I, I treat my body really well and I have treated my body really well. And it thus gives me a greater capacity to get things done in the world. 
I don't mm-hmm. treat it like a machine, but I treat it like a very precious partner to me. And we can then do really good stuff together as a result. What is one new habit that you're cultivating right now? Meditation. That uh, in terms of investing in building social infrastructure, mm-hmm. I wanted to make sure that I was being very clean about my own personal habits. So I've been in a training program. I'm now apprenticing with this program with this firm so that we can offer custom designed programs and projects together. But it's called Tenth Dot, and it's in Minnesota or Minneapolis. Where is it? Missouri. I knew it was- <laughs> it's in Missouri. <laughs> And uh, I have a <laughs> program that mixes yogic traditions with gestalt psychology and uh, organizational development. And wow. it has made it so that my meditation practice, I meditate 30 minutes a day now kind of as a rule. And of course, I don't get it in every day because I may be traveling or I may wake up late, have an early interview schedule, et cetera. But having a mindfulness practice that is significant like that, where I can meditate now for hours at a time and it doesn't feel like something I have to force myself to do, has created a state of just deep awareness that has, it's impacted every aspect of my life. Wow, that's fantastic. I personally, I need to work a lot on my ability to meditate. I've tried and maybe I just Maybe the point is to not try, but it's something that I definitely have a challenge with. And I know there are tremendous benefits, but I don't know. Maybe that should be the the new habit that I'm cultivating because <laughs> I'm sure that I could use it. What is one purchase you've made in the last six months for $100 or less that has greatly impacted your life? Clothes. <laughs> I bought these two outfits, girl. <laughs> Um, So here's the thing, right? I tend to be very practical. And it really occurred to me that I'm at that point in my life where I'm a few different people, right? Mm -hmm. I, I am a little bit out there on the dance floor. I get down. And I can also walk the halls of Capitol Hill and negotiate for African Americans and climate change. And I need outfits that represent all of these faces of myself. Mm -hmm. If you had access to a time machine and could travel back to visit an earlier version of yourself as a child, adolescent, or in your early 20s, when would you visit and what would you say to your younger self? I would go to my early 20s self and say, you do not have to worry about finding a man. (laughs) Have fun. And your husband is going to be the most incredible, delicious, soul-shattering human being in a way that you couldn't have anticipated and you couldn't have planned for. So do you, and that part of your life will take care of itself. Mm. That's excellent advice. Excellent. And I've seen, I've seen a couple of pictures of you two on your, on your websites, and you look very in love. So. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> nice job. Uh, so I'm going to get into some some internet resources and some books so you can just spit out some stuff that you uh, that has helped you along the way. But do you have an internet resource that you can share with all our listeners that you have found uh, incredibly helpful over the last few years? Gaiam TV, which is where my yoga online went, my physical. Asana yoga practice is also pretty key to my life. And I needed to be able to do it anywhere. And it has been a huge contributor to my personal health. What books can you recommend to sustainable minds out there hoping to shift their mindset specifically to become the change that they want to see in the world? Defending Beef by Nicolette Han Nyman, who mm-hmm. was the other half of Nyman Ranch. Okay. Now that they're doing their own thing, but she is an environmental lawyer who is also a vegetarian, who is also a beef rancher, mm-hmm. which is just amazing. And the way that she talks about beef specifically, but it gets into all of these things I was talking about with carbon sequestration through soil. And the other thing that I would recommend is Revolution and Evolution in the 20th Century by Grace Lee Boggs. 
which feels particularly important to me because she passed away this year and she was 100 years old and has been setting thought when it comes to social infrastructure for decades. And it's not specifically about the environment, but I feel like it sets the stage for thinking about the environment through a lens that is not just environmentalism or climate that's much more holistic. Mm -hmm. So before we get into our last couple questions, I just want to make sure that people know where they can go to find you. So first of all, your personal website, Nikki Silvestri, and that is spelled N-I-K-K-I-S-I-L-V-E-S-T-R-I.com. That's your personal website. And of course, uh, SilvestriStrategies.com is your uh, your new thing, and people can go there and find out about all the great stuff that you're doing. And also, as you mentioned earlier, Nikki C. Silvestri on Twitter. Mm-hmm. So please do go there and get in touch with Nikki if you're interested at all in any of the things that we've discussed. Uh, that's where you can get in touch with her directly, and she will give you some stuff to take action on right away. So that's pretty awesome. Do you have any words or parting pieces of guidance to give sustainable minds out there? Or is there anything that you wanted to address that I just didn't ask? I would just emphasize that there is no, I I can't overstate the importance of a personal contemplative practice in one's journey to be sustainable. Considering how sustainability is a scale It is not a state that one achieves and then one is forever more sustainable. Mm -hmm. It is a dynamic relationship between oneself and the environment within which we move. And being able to be very clear with our own desires, our own needs, our own behaviors, the truth about the way that we walk in the world is key to being sustainable. Awesome. Thank you so much, Nikki, for taking time out of your very busy schedule <laughs> to thank you for uh, me down and staying with it i so appreciate it <laughs> well you know i i really with this project i really want to be inspiring people of all ages but also people that look like me people that look like us i don't feel as though there are enough faces of african american people or latino people and asian people in the climate change conversation not to say that they're not there but if you don't see them or if those people aren't getting enough airtime which i feel like i can help a little bit with that with my tiny little show over here that people that are my age and younger you know who are in college or just getting out of college and trying to figure out what they're going to do with their lives this is something that is important right now and we're still at the beginning of it there's still time for them to get in, to get involved, and if they want to, to make this a part of their career or their entire career. There are so many opportunities, but I think that it's just difficult when you don't see someone out there who looks like you doing that work for you to imagine yourself there, uh, which is one of the main reasons why I wanted to interview you. And of course, you've got so much wonderful experience and knowledge when it comes to running organizations and uh, really getting the community uh, connected with that. So I really appreciate this interview. And yeah, just thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. You've been listening to A Sustainable Mind podcast. To hear more interviews just like this one, please subscribe on iTunes or visit asustainablemind.com. Thanks for listening and see you next time. Thank you.